A few weeks ago, a crew of volunteers went to Lenexa, Kansas, just west of Kansas City, Missouri, to decommission and move a Lucent 5 ESS to our new museum in Colorado. The switch was donated by the very awesome folks at Everfast Fiber Networks. Earlier this year, they emailed to let us know that their switch was being powered down, and they were wondering if we were interested in displaying it in our new museum. Yup. I suspect that most of you watching this video already know what a 5ESS is, but for the as of yet uninitiated, the 5E is a modern, at least compared to what I'm used to working on, digital switching system that was developed by Bell Labs and manufactured and sold through the 80s and 90s, first by Western Electric and then later by Lucent Technologies. 5 ESSN were everywhere, and if you've used a telephone at all in the last 30 years, it is a fact that your voice has gone through one of these babies at some point. But 5 ESSs are rapidly being phased out of the network in these last few years, and since we are in the business of preserving stuff like this, we wanted to see if we could get our hands on one. So when Everfast made the offer, we said yes. I went out there and met up with Chris, who would be my main contact throughout this process. Thanks, Chris. You are awesome. My goal was to kind of scope out the machine and see if it would fit our needs and what actual hardware it contained. While I was there, I took tons of documentary photos and videos of each cabinet and the cable trays above so that back in Seattle, we could come up with some kind of plan for how best to remove the everything non-destructively. Foreshadowing this area here, this was an absolute nightmare. Here's a top-down physical view of the switch in Google Sheets. It contains three aisles, and we can use this to learn the basics of how a 5E works. The areas in yellow are what we think is the minimum needed for a working display. In terms of the major blocks, we've got an AM, a CM, and some SMs. The AM is the administrative module, and that contains the big computer that manages everything. Network people would know this as the OAM section of the switch. It provides a human interface, runs the main software, and is where most troubleshooting and operation stuff takes place. This has gone through several iterations since the first 5 ESS back in the 80s, but in any remaining machine, it's almost certainly an AT&T 3B21 computer running Unix RTR. The SMs are the switching modules of the 5 ESS. These contain the physical interfaces to the outside world and come in various flavors for different types of protocols, like Sonnet or POTS or whatever. This switch has lots of Sonnet and OC3 stuff, but for now, we're just going to worry about the regular telephone lines. Those are all over here in SM1. The SM has an SMC at its core, which is the controller for the switching module. Then, building out on either side of the SMC, we have LTPs, or line trunk peripherals. This is where the external interface actually happens. So, in the case of the telephone lines, the analog audio comes in and is sliced into the TDM soup of the SM and then switched wherever it needs to go. The SMs are kind of neat. Um, each one of them is a totally standalone independent switch. So, even if the entire rest of the system was destroyed, as long as an SM had power, it could still provide dial tone and switch calls within itself. But in order to get calls to other parts of the switch or to other switches entirely, we have to go through a CM or a communication module. A CM is a control and switching point for one or more SMs. If one SM wants to switch a call to a user on a different SM, it will have to talk to a CM to do that. Same thing, if a call is going out of this 5 ESS to some other switch somewhere, it will need to pass through a CM, which acts as a gateway to the external network. So in order to have a basic working switch, we will need at least one SM, one CM, and one AM. Now, 
The CM can grow pretty large in order to support all of the SMs under it, but in the most basic configuration, we need just cabinets five and six of the CM, which make up the core of that module. And then all of these other SMs over here are just extra stuff. We will still take everything, but in terms of setting this back up again, it's really helpful to understand what's strictly required versus just what's nice to have. When our team arrived at Everfast on Monday morning, we got right to work. Phil removed all the rear doors, and I began decabling the battery and ground feeders to each frame. Alan began unbolting the frames from each other, and Michi and Angela sorted out the wiring and the cable trays. Matt got to work on the CM, which would take several days overall. This is the communications module, CM. Pretty sure that's what that means. Uh, but this is the core of all of the TDM switching in this. And I've been decabling all of this. Uh, so this is the, the data plane. So this is what has the uh, telephone calls and the control cabling peeling it back toward the middle here because five and six are the uh, required frames and then everything outward from that is optional and was added to this machine as it grew. So uh, peeling it back toward the thing that we are required to have and hopefully haven't broken too much. Right. So you have to basically, you're taking all this stuff and you're working it back that way and then at some point we're going to like coil it up or store yeah, it over have, there th th this one's already been done uh this one's already been severed at all the yeah the junction points and so this is going to need to get basically tied tied up and, and affixed to the frame with the with the lacing point or something ideally so that we can put the doors back on it but right. the, this these two frames may ship without the doors on we will see. Thanks, Matt. The nice thing is, is that Phil managed to figure out the labeling scheme on the wires going to the CM and SM cabinets. Knowing that, we could use the information printed on the cable itself to reconstruct the wiring instead of having to label each one individually, which would have cost us tons of extra time. So we accelerated our work significantly by just pulling wires out of the peripheral frames without worrying too much about where they were plugged in. That is, except for Matt, who had to be very careful to get everything right in the CM cabinets. One of the main blocking items for me was the cable in the trays. It seemed orderly down in the cabinets where each cable plugged into a particular spot, but up in the trays, it was all looped back and knotted to itself. It seemed like these cables all came in preset lengths, and then they just put the ends where they needed to go, laced them into the cabinets, and then threw the rest up top. You can see from this cable that they can get pretty long. All right, so it's day two. You're seeing me in full gross work mode. There's Angela down on the floor, tying up the the cables that I just pulled out of the tray. I saw Alan at the end of the aisle. And uh, we're getting these trays cleared out so that we can start taking the hats off. The empty tray. It wasn't like that a little while ago. Right. There's Alan. And there's Matt. Where's my badge? Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Back to work. To make things worse, the cables up in the trays would get stuck if you pulled on them too much. So there was a lot of going up and down a ladder or working with a buddy to free the cables in the tray while someone else pulled down at the floor. But pretty soon, frames were moving around the floor into neat little rows. Sarah, are you a crime scene? I am, I am quickly becoming a crime scene, yes. <laughs> Please draw chalk around me. <laughs> As we worked our way back, we got closer and closer to the CSPC, which is the core of the administrative module of the machine. This was the worst of the cable hell. The 3B21 computer had its little tendrils in each cabinet of the machine, copper for serial and then fiber optic and coax as well. The serial cables were the worst. 
they all had ferrites on them and they were wrapped around the ferrites, which even with the ferrites removed, caused tons of knots to develop. We couldn't just cut these cables and start over because we were trying to preserve this machine and many of these cables are bespoke. So I spent hours and hours on a ladder pulling apart the knots above these cabinets. Michi and Angela were down on the floor combing the cables that I threw down to them. Eventually, Matt finished his work on the CM and joined us as well. By Thursday afternoon, Phil and Alan got to take a much deserved early break and the three of us stuck around working on the last knots of the AM cabling. I can't tell you how good it felt to get the last of the cables cleared from the trays. And I can't believe that we actually finished this job a full day earlier than expected. This has literally never happened to us before. So on our last day in Lenexa, we made sure everything was in one space and I drew a box around the equipment with green tape. Our data center movers would be showing up in two days and I wanted to make it as obvious as possible to them what to take and what to leave. It's really nice to be able to point to a literal rectangle on the floor and say, anything inside this rectangle, go in the truck. Anything outside of this rectangle, do not touch. And just like that, a few days later, the 5ESS showed up at our building in Arvada. I gotta hand it to our moving company, Technology Movers. They made this process painless for us, and they are not paying me to say that. I have moved literal tons of stuff during my time with the museum, and I know that it is not as easy as it looks to an outsider. Having the frames just show up at our door and be unloaded was so nice. They're not gonna stay in this location, but this is a perfectly good staging area for now. We have the entire rest of the museum to build, and I'm sure that things will be moving around plenty of times before we're done. We can't wait to show this switch off to our visitors in the years to come. See you soon.